Amen. Thank you, Andrew. And he asked if I was ready. I said, I was born again ready. <laughs> Amen. Oh, it's been rich. Everything's been great. Dwayne is such a blessing. I tell you, I love Dwayne. He's a, he's a great minister. You know, it amazes me how similar we are. Like the points he went through on Paul's thorn in the flesh, I know he hadn't heard me minister on that. Those are exactly the same points emphasizing the exact same things. It's just, it's really unusual. I don't know anybody else that we are so similar in the way that God has revealed himself to us. And yet I believe it's probably because he had that real dramatic encounter where he saw himself die in Christ. And mine was different, but it was the same thing. I saw my self-righteousness and God revealed his holiness. And man, I just repented and I died to myself. It's, a, it's not a one-time thing, but I mean, it's amazing. I think that because God touched our life in very similar ways, that therefore he's taken us on a very similar path to learn things. And it's just amazing how, how similar we are other than me looking better. <laughs> and my hair's combed and things like that. <laughs> I heard Dwayne one time say something about somebody came up and says, do you put a perm in your hair? And he said, would I pay somebody to look this way? <laughs> I thought that was really funny. <laughs> anyway, it's been great. I love Dwayne's teaching. It's just awesome. So let me go back to Galatians. And uh, is there anybody here that was not here last night when I ministered? Wow, quite a few of you. Well, you missed it. <laughs> I hadn't got time to go back and say all of those things again. But basically, I started sharing on grace from Paul's letter to the Galatians. I said last night that Romans is his masterpiece, just a scholarly approach. Galatians is where he's ticked off and he's telling these people that, man, if anybody preaches something to you other than what I've said, let him be accursed. And then Hebrews, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. I personally believe it was Paul because it's exactly like his revelation and the way he ministers. But the book of Hebrews... Uh, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews are really, really, really strong on the grace of God, and each one of them specifically counter, counter, counter the Old Testament law because for people who were religious, the law was the thing that held them back from understanding the grace of God. The law gave you what you deserved, and uh, the New Testament gives you the grace of God. So each one of these are really good. But Galatians, I kind of like it. I'm, I'm one of these that the Lord just speaks to me. Like when I was having trouble with my weight, I'm still dealing with it. It's not like I've perfected it, but I'm 30 pounds less than I was 15 years ago, and I've kept it all off. For, and the way the Lord spoke to me, well, I said, God, i got to have an answer. And I mean, in 10 seconds, he says, you're glutton. Now, see, somebody else, the Lord might say, you need to learn to control yourself. Or do, He just tells me like it is. And so uh, I was a glutton, and I quit being a glutton, and I've lost weight. That'll really bless some people. <laughs> the only way you get overweight is to eat more than you need, more often than you need it. End the story. You quit eating, you'll lose weight. I guarantee it every time. So anyway... I like Galatians. So we've already covered Galatians chapter one and chapter two. In Galatians chapter three, he begins saying, and again, this just shows you how, man, he's just in their face with this. He said, oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Right here, he called these people fools. He says, you've been bewitched. It's demonic deceptions, and you are not obeying the truth. Did you know if you approach people that way today, most people take a tremendous offense for you to call them a fool or to say that, man, it's demonic deception. You're, you're being deceived by the devil. And uh, to sit there and say that uh, you aren't living the truth. Man, if you said any of those things to people today outside of the context of like a church service, if you were to just go up 
to some of these politicians and say that, man, you're a fool, <laughs> that it's demonic what you're doing, killing babies, giving them 28 days after a baby is born that you can just choose to let your baby die because you don't want it. That's murder. It That's demonic. It and then... And that this isn't the truth. We've got the truth. They'll say, so do you think you've got the truth? Absolutely. This is exactly what Paul's saying. To operate outside of the grace of God, it is absolutely foolish. It's demonic. It's, it's demonic in its uh, origin. Boy, those are strong statements. And it says, Behold, for whose eyes Jesus Christ hath it been evidently set forth crucified among you. Paul taught when he refers to the cross, and this is going to be done in the fifth chapter especially in other places, but when Paul was referring to the cross, he wasn't talking about a piece of wood or just a historical fact. He was talking about the fact that Jesus bore everything for us, our punishment, and we died in him just like what Dwayne was sharing when he saw that vision. When he was referring to the cross, he was referring to the fact that it's all been paid for. There's nothing you can do to add to it. Anything you try and add to what Jesus has done actually subtracts from it. It pollutes it. And so this is what he's referring to. And he preached the cross so much that it was like Jesus was crucified in front of these people. They saw the substitutionary death of Jesus. Sad to say, a lot of people today still don't understand this. They think that Jesus didn't pay at all. He only paid a portion and that you also have to suffer for your sins and you have to go through separation. Again, Pastor Dwayne was sitting there saying that all of our sin, past, present, and future, has even been paid for in advance. It's paid for. The cross paid for everything. And when you go back under the law that you have to perform and that you have to do something to make yourself worthy, you are voiding the cross. You're saying Jesus didn't pay enough. You know, I had a man come to one of my meetings in Dallas and I was preaching on this. This has been 25 or 30 years ago. And he came up and he rolled up his sleeves and showed me his elbows and he rolled up his pants legs and showed me his knees and he was scarred, and it was because he was in uh, Mexico, and he was a Catholic, and they taught that during Lent you had to suffer and you had to punish yourself. And so he literally crawled three miles over broken glass to do repentance for his sins. And he even told me about a friend of his that they crucified, and he actually died. They didn't intend for him to die, but they actually will crucify sometimes so that people are also bearing the suffering and things and they think that this is what they have to do. I tell you, that is an offense against God. That's saying, Jesus, you didn't pay enough. I also have to suffer. And did you know people here in America would say, well, no, we don't do that. But they still have Lent where they have to sit there and suffer. They still, like, you have to go through certain things. And if you sin then you have to be separated from God for a period of time to pay for your sin. You can't just go in like Dwayne was quoting uh, Hebrews 4, 16, enter boldly in the time of need, not just when everything's going good, but in the time of need you enter in boldly to the throne of grace that you may have found grace. And see, they don't understand that. They think that, no, you can't fellowship with God if there's any sin, if there's any iniquity in your life. That is... That is coming against what Jesus paid for on the cross. Jesus paid it all or he paid nothing at all. And if he paid it all, then we don't need to try and add to it our worthiness and our goodness. And man, there's so many things Dwayne was talking about that, man, I'd love to teach on those things. We've both been hitting around humility a lot, but humility is an automatic byproduct of understanding the grace of God. If you are a proud person, and pride isn't only arrogance, thinking you're better than everybody else, but if you are a person who has all of the burden upon yourself to do something, you feel like you've got to make it happen, you're a proud person. I'm not going to stay here, but I've got to say this. Over in 1 Peter chapter 5, and this same thing is said over in uh, James chapter 4. Both of those say the same thing. But in 1 Peter 
chapter 5, uh, it says in verse, let's see, where is this? In verse 5, likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. The way to more grace is to humble yourself. Humility invites and is a byproduct of grace. Arrogance, which isn't the only manifestation of pride, but self-sufficiency is also pride. It stops the grace of God in your life. Look at these next verses. It says, humble yourselves, therefore. The word therefore links it together. You have to humble yourself in order to get this more grace. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And then verse 7 says, casting all of your care upon him, for he careth for you. Those are not separate thoughts. They're all linked. If you are taking care, if you're worried, if you stay up at night, oh God, how am I going to pull this off? God, what is going to happen? How are we ever going to make this work? Whether it's finances, whether it's healing, whether it's relation, whether it's talking about your vision for the future, whatever it is, if you are struggling and under care, it's because you haven't humbled yourself. When you humble yourself, it's God's deal. And this goes along with so much of the things that Dwayne and I are saying. When you understand the grace of God and that it's not your goodness, it's in your weakness that his strength is made perfect, it just allows you to live a carefree life. You know, I was talking around the table with somebody just last week and they were talking about, man, how they're stressed out. And they said, you just don't act like you ever get stressed out. And I said, well, I've got plenty of room to grow, but I honestly don't ever worry about anything. I just do not worry. I do not bear the care. And they said, why? And I quoted these verses and I said, if you are worried, if you're bearing care, it's because you're a proud person. It's because you're dependent upon yourself. <laughs> and this guy was like, I hit him between the eyes. He says, I'm guilty. But that's exactly true. And did you know grace will set you free from this. Because if you understand that it's not your goodness, it's just God. He did it all. His cross, he paid for everything. There is nothing you can add to it. There's nothing that's going to make you have more pull with God than what Jesus did. Your fasting and prayer won't increase God's love for you. It won't increase him answering your prayers. Fasting and prayer doesn't change God's attitude towards you one iota, but it'll change your attitude towards God. There's still a place to fast and pray, but it is not so that you could get God to move in your life more. Studying the Word helps you. It changes your heart towards God, but it, studying the Word doesn't make God love you anymore. Once you understand this, it just takes all the pressure off of you that, God, it's all up to you and it's not me. Anyway, I could expand on this for a long time, but, but that's what he's talking about. He says, you're fools if you are trusting in yourself, if you believe that you have to do things to earn God's favor. You're bewitched. It's demonic deception to put the burden upon you for salvation, not just the initial born-again salvation, but for healing, for prosperity, or anything like that. It's demonic deception to make you feel like you have to do things to get God to perform, and it's certainly not the truth. In verse 2, he says, This only what I have learned of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And the obvious answer to this is it was faith. It wasn't your goodness that produced it. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Boy, this is great reasoning. This is one of the very first things that God began to show me grace by. And I put this together with Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. It says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did you receive Jesus? Was it because you'd been fasting and praying and studying the word and going to church and paying your tithes and doing everything right? The vast majority of us, we encountered the Lord just like Virginia 
and Caroline were sharing that, man, they, they sought the Lord, they wanted the Lord, but it wasn't their goodness or anything. It was just the grace of God that pursued them and overcame them. Some of you were living in adultery. Some of you took the name of Jesus in vain every day of your life. Some of you, man, were whoremongers. You were drunks. You were addicts. You were all kinds of things. And in that state, you got born again. If you receive the greatest gift that you could ever get, which is the forgiveness of your sins when you didn't have any goodness to your name, why do you think now that you have to keep all of these rules? And if you don't study the Word, God's liable to let you die of cancer because you haven't read the Bible. If that was true, He would have let you die and go to hell because you hadn't been reading the Bible. You see the difference? We get saved by grace. We sing, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And we sing about the grace of God. And then you go to church. And then they tell you, if you don't study the word, if you don't come to church, if you don't do this, God won't bless you. That's inconsistent. It's hypocrisy. You know, the four spiritual laws that was put out by... Campus Crusade for Christ. There's been millions of people probably get born again through that. I'm not 100% against it. It really makes the case that we are separated from God. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2. You know, God's hand isn't short that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And it really makes the case that there's, they have a little picture of a mountain over here, and here's God over there, and then over here is you, and there's this huge gulf in between you, and nothing can bridge this gap. None of your good works. They show all of your good works trying to reach over to God, and they all fall short. But then on the next page, they put in a cross, and through the cross, man can now come over here and be united with God through the cross, and that's good. But then the next page, if you sin... They wipe out the cross, and here you are again, separated from your sin. And just like um, Dwayne was sharing, Jesus forgave us of all sin, past, present, and even future sin. When you come to the Lord, he wiped out all of the sin. Your sin does not separate you from God once you're born again. But see, this is basically what the church teaches. You have to come to Jesus and receive salvation as a gift because you can't earn it. So you get saved by grace. But as soon as you get saved, now you got to start performing. And if you don't perform, God won't answer your prayer. He may not send you to hell, but he won't answer your prayer. He won't fellowship with you. God won't use a dirty vessel. God hasn't got any other kind of vessel to use. <laughs> this is saying, are you so foolish? You received everything from God as a gift of grace, but now that you're born again... You got to earn it. You know, if we just understood that one point, if we only followed this logic, that would revolutionize most people's lives. Satan is an accuser of the brethren. And the only thing he can accuse you over is all of your failures and stuff like this. And if you understand that you've been forgiven of everything, as it says in Psalms 103, that he's removed your sins as far as the east is from the west. God is not imputing sin unto you. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. The word impute means to put to your account. It's as if you never sinned. That's my little definition of justified, just as if I'd never sinned. God looks at you and sin isn't an issue. Now, God knows that we sin and he knows that sin is an inroad of Satan into our life. And so, yes, he'll show you, quit doing this because you're allowing Satan to eat your lunch and pop the bag. And so he'll tell you to quit sinning for your own benefit, but it doesn't stop God from moving in your life. It didn't stop God from saving you. You know, if a person came forward to, today and they said, man, I need to be born again, would you pray with me to receive salvation? And if I said, God showed me that you're an adulterer, what makes you think God would forgive you? If they understood the, the gospel, they would say, that's the reason I need to be born again. Man, I need it. And we would pray and they'd get born again. And yet, let them come as a Christian. And if I say, you hadn't studied the word the way you should, and they'd say, well, now I know why God's not healing me. 
because I hadn't studied the word. He'd forgive him with adultery, but man, you just you have a fight on the way to church with your mate, and he's liable to let you die of cancer. See, that's incompatible. This is what he's talking about. Are you so foolish that you started in grace? You received everything as a gift of grace, but now that you're a Christian, now you got to perform. And so he says in verse 4, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And again, the answer is it's by faith. It's not by the works of the law. Dwayne was referring to this, that no minister is up here ministering through their own goodness. And yet a lot of people, you know, I was an introvert. Many of you have heard me say this. And I couldn't even look at a person in the face and talk to them. And I can tell you the reason I was doing it, because I was totally self-focused, wondering whether I had done everything right, what, wondering if I'd stumble on my words or do something wrong. It was all focused on me. It was all thinking about me. And I felt like I had to do something to earn God's favor. And there are many of you that have had God heal you of cancers. You, your marriage has been healed. You've been healed financially. You've got great things that could bless other people. And yet if I was to call on you and ask you to come up here and share, immediately you, you'd feel like, man, I'm not worthy. I haven't prepared. What, you know, and you start looking to yourself. And that's what makes people unable to share and stuff is because they're just so focused on themselves. But a person who's ministering and does it by the Spirit of God, they aren't focused on themselves. They are letting God flow them, through them. They're doing it according to God's ability. And so he's drawing on this. You know, I remember the first time I ever said that I'd seen people raised from the dead. I had somebody come up and say, who do you think you are? Because they thought I was claiming that somehow or another it was some virtue of my own that caused a person to be raised from the dead and not God. But this is immediately. If you start talking about what God has done, people will immediately look at you and think, I just can't believe that God would use you. Why? Because you see all my faults and failures. But God doesn't see us that way. Man, this is awesome what he's saying. It's the grace of God flowing through people. And then he says, it's even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. That's a quotation from Genesis 15, 6. And Abraham messed up in a lot of ways. He was willing to let a man take his wife not once but twice just to save his neck. He was willing to let somebody sexually abuse his wife to save his neck. That is not good. We read this in the Bible and somehow or another just skip over it. But man, I guarantee you, if I was overseas and if I was someplace and they saw Jamie and they said, man, I like her. And I said, I've never seen this woman before. Help yourself. <laughs> I guarantee you, that'd be wrong on my part. Abraham did that. Abraham was not the best example of anything, but according to Genesis 15, 6, the Lord told him, count the number of stars in the sky, and if you can count all of them, that's how numerous your children will be. And he said he believed, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. It was grace. It was faith in God's grace that produced it, and that's the example that he's using. And he says in verse 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. Again, we use the word faith and grace, and these have become religious words, and we sometimes don't understand what he's talking about. But when he says those that are faith are the same with Abraham, what he's talking about is those who believe in grace and not earning things through your own goodness. Those are the people who are justified in the sight of God. And it says in the next verse, and the scripture was... Uh, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying in thee shall all nations be blessed. Man, I'm talking as fast as I can. I don't know if I'll get to that, but the rest of this chapter is talking about that that seed was Jesus is what he's talking about. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law. Now here he is again. See, after he talks about faith and grace, he comes back and starts countering the law. And you will find this all throughout Paul's teaching. 
He was ministering to religious people. And today we've got a religious background that the moment you start saying that God has paid for your sins and sin isn't an issue, people will immediately come back to the law and say, what about the law saying that thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that? And it's this law mentality that keeps people from receiving the grace of God. So that's what he's countering right here. He says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That's a quotation from the last verse of Deuteronomy chapter 27. And they put half of the people on one mountain and spoke the blessings. They put half of the congregation on the other mountain and spoke the curses. And the last thing was they said, you're cursed if you don't keep all of it. This goes along with the New Testament scripture, James chapter 2, verse 10, that says, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. So in order to get the blessings of the law, in order for the law to work for you instead of against you, you've got to keep every precept, every precept, not 99 out of 100, but 100 out of 100. You've got to keep them all is what this is saying. And if you don't keep them all, you come under the curse. And man, I could spend an hour right here turning over to Deuteronomy 28 and showing you the first 14 verses or the blessings if you keep the law, verses 15 through 68, or all of the curses that will come upon you, if you don't keep the law, there are more curses than there are blessings. And the blessings are dependent in Deuteronomy 28, 1. It shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments. Not most of them, but all of them. Man, this... People that preach the law, they just conveniently leave this out. They say that you, you have to do all of these things. And if you say, well, have you kept all of it? Well, no, but I, I keep the most of them. See, it doesn't work that way. People who are preaching the law don't understand what they're preaching. They're condemning their own, their own self because nobody has ever kept the law except Jesus. And because of that, there is nobody that can claim relationship with God based on their performance. I don't care if you perform better than I do. Who wants to be the best sinner that ever got rejected by God? We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody deserves the blessing of God. So in, if you are under the law, then you are under the curse because every one of us have broken it. And it says in verse 14, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. That was quoted from the Old Testament. And again, even in the Old Testament, it was revealed that the only way you could really have relationship with God was by faith in what Jesus did, not what you do. Man, that's awesome. And look at this in verse 12. This is one of the most startling scriptures in the whole Bible for religious people. It says the law is not of faith. Romans 14, 23 says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Did you know the law is sin if you use it trying to gain relationship with God? Now, the law isn't sin in itself. It says that in Romans chapter 7. Is the law sin? God forbid. No, that's not what I'm saying. But the purpose of the law wasn't to give you victory over sin. It was to give sin victory over you. Thank you for that thunder silence. <laughs> People are thinking, no way. Yes way. 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the law strengthened sin. The strength of sin is the law. Romans chapter 7, I was alive without the... Or, yeah, Romans chapter 7, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died in the law which was ordained unto life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. That's uncontrolled, unrestrained lust. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. The law wasn't given to give you victory over sin. Matter of fact, Romans 6, 14 says, The sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Grace is what breaks the dominion of sin. 
the law actually makes sin come alive. It makes lust come alive on the inside of you. The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. And that means you're going to live under the curse. But in verse 13, it says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So going back to the law, Deuteronomy chapter 28 says, All of these blessings will come upon you if you hearken diligently to observe all of the commandments that I'm giving you. No New Testament believer should try and receive from God based on that. Here's the way that a New Testament believer should read Deuteronomy chapter 28. It is coming to pass since Jesus hearkened diligently unto the voice of the Lord his God to observe and to do all of the commandments. And because I've put faith in him, I now receive everything based on what he has done. And all of these blessings come upon me and overtake me through Jesus. But I've actually heard ministers stand up before and say, if you aren't receiving all of these blessings, then it's because you hadn't hearkened diligently enough. Try harder. Instead of 30 minutes a day, pray an hour a day. You go to church twice a week. Go out and minister to others, and they put you back under this performance thing. And just because today people don't talk about circumcision, other than me, apparently, <laughs> and because they don't talk about things like that, people think, well, I'm not under the law, and yet you've still got this same mentality. It's like you're driving down the same road. You're headed to the same destination. You just switch cars. No longer is it talking about the feast days and all of the uh, animal sacrifices, but now you've got to go to church and pay your tithes and live holy and do this, this, and this. And, you know, as you heard Caroline and, and Virginia talking about today, that, man, you've got to go to church so many times. Uh, they were sharing things with us over lunch about how they had to be at church on Monday night for testimony night and all this other stuff. And they put these things on you, and this is what you've got to do. It's the same mentality. You've got to do these things to be accepted with God. And that is totally wrong. Christ redeemed us from the curse. And so you can obtain Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 through 14 through what Jesus did for you. And you can avoid Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68 because Jesus became a curse for you. So he actually turned all of the curses into blessings. You no longer have the botch, the mildew, imrods, blasting, whatever those things are. I'm not totally sure what they are, but they sound really bad. <laughs> and we're redeemed from all of that through what Jesus did. Isn't that awesome? Brethren, I speak after the manner of man, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. You know what he's beginning to talk about right now? He's going back to Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, that he says, count the stars. If you can number the stars, so shall your seed be. And Abraham believed, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And then if you go to the rest of those verses in Genesis 15, God had Abraham kill animals and separate them into two parts. And then uh, Abraham stayed there all evening and the, he had to drive the birds away. And at sunset, there was a smoking, uh, what was it? A burning lamp and a smoking flax. There you go, whatever it was. Anyway, it was God. It was this symbol, symbolism that God walked between the pieces of the animal and cut covenant, and that's the covenant that he's talking about. When Abraham believed God, his faith was counted to him for righteousness, and that covenant existed 430 years before the covenant of law that came to Moses. And that's what he's talking about right here. So if, if that covenant was confirmed, which it was when God passed between the pieces, no man disannulleth or addeth now thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed, singular, were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. 
again, this was somewhat hidden in the Old Testament. People thought that if you were a Jew, a physical descendant of Abraham, that you were an heir of the covenant. But he goes on to show that those that are of faith, matter of fact, he said that right up here, those that are of faith are blessed with Abraham, not just physical descendants. Now, there are some promises that were made to physical Jews, but the bulk of them were made to the spiritual seed of uh, Abraham, and that's talking about Christ. And in verse 17, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So the point that he's making is that faith was in effect before the covenant of law came along. And he even goes on. Man, I'm talking as fast as I can, but he, he even goes on and he says the law was added because of transgressions right here. It wasn't God's number one way to deal with us. The Lord waited 2,000 years after Adam and Eve sinned before he gave the law. You know why? Because he didn't want you to know what a mess you were. He didn't want you to live under guilt and condemnation. He could have shown Adam and Eve how bad they were. He could have told them, you know, if I was to just take this front row right down here and just show Mom and Susan and Travis and all of the ones that gave their testimony today, and if I was just to go down here, that's seven people. And if he would have showed Adam, look what you've done to Muhammad's life. Look what you've done to Susan. Travis beaten and left for dead, drug dealer, and on and on. And if he had just shown that, I believe that Adam and Eve could not have lived with themselves to see what their sin had brought in. He didn't want us to know the fullness of it. He wanted to express his love and accept us, but people were taking God's lack of punishment upon sin as approval or indifference. And they thought, well... Cain killed a man, and he got by with it. God put a mark on his forehead, so his great-great-great-grandson, Lamech, comes along and says, I've killed a man in self-defense. My murder is, is more justified than Cain's. If Cain got by with it, I'll get by with it. See, that's wrong thinking. They were comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves, and the Bible says that's not wise. But this is what people did. They looked around, and they look at people like, Ellen Degenerate, and she's, uh, she's a millionaire, and she's on television, and she's a homo, and she gets by with this, and so it must be okay. No, it's not okay. But people tend to compare themselves, and so they think that it's okay. And so God had to establish a law, and that law brought condemnation. 2 Corinthians 3, 9, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, it brought death. The law did a lot of bad things. It's similar to when you see something on television and they say, if you've got headaches, take this pill. It could kill you. It'll make you impotent. It'll give you a runny stool. And man, just... I think, give me back my headache. Praise God. It may solve the problem, but man, look at the side effects to this thing. Well, the law did solve a problem. It took away any deception that we were going to be accepted just because somebody else got by with it and didn't die. It showed us God's standard. It showed us God's wrath, and it was a deterrent to sin. Uh, Proverbs chapter, I believe it's verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 6, says that uh, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil and but by mercy and or no it was the opposite by mercy and truth iniquity is purged and by the fear of the lord men depart from evil so the fear of the lord the law causes people to quit sinning but it can't purge them it's only mercy and truth that purges people but the law had a function and that was to show you that you needed god and to show you that you were in a mess and that still has a purpose today our nation needs to see the law to see that, man, what we're doing, and we're, it's just spitting in the face of God, saying that I don't care what God said. God, Jesus said he made them male and female, but, man, the Democrats have created 300 genders or whatever it is. There's only two, according to Scripture. We need to still recognize that it's wrong, but the law could only show you your sin. It could show you your your condemnation, Romans chapter 3, verse 19, by the law is the knowledge of sin. 
It couldn't set you free from sin. And this is what he's talking about, that the law, which was 430 years later, it was added because of transgressions. Goes on to say in verse 17, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions. It was added to that covenant of faith. That was the, that was the real covenant. The other one was just an add on. And it says it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come. The seed, verse 16, was Christ. So the law was only temporary until Christ came to whom the promises were made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. There's a great truth there that I hadn't got time to go into. In verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which should have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. The law could not produce life because it was conditional upon our compliance. And you couldn't just comply with the majority of it. You had to comply 100%. Nobody ever did it. So we're the ones that disqualified ourselves from receiving relationship with God through the law. And so if the law could have given life, it would have come that by that. But in verse 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. So again, the law was only temporary until Jesus came. Now that Jesus has come, we should not be under this performance-based thing that God is going to reject you or accept you based on your performance. You are completely accepted with God or rejected based on your acceptance or rejection of Jesus. And if you've accepted Jesus, you will never be forsaken. You will never be cast out, even if you don't live right. Now again... I wish I had time to put that in its proper perspective. I'm not saying that you can just go live in sin. You, you could go live in sin, but it's stupid if you do because Satan is going to come in and destroy you. Romans 6, 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you go live in sin, you're giving Satan a direct inroad into your life and he only comes to steal to kill and to destroy, John chapter 10, verse 10. So if you go out and live in sin, there are consequences to that sin. You will suffer, but they aren't from God. uh, Dwayne was making a point about of your flesh shall you reap corruption. There are consequences, but it's not from God. God loves you even if you're doing something stupid. But the point I'm trying to get across is God loves you, stupid. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't make him love you more. You can't make him love you less. There's things you can do that'll make you love him less. There's things you can do that'll make you love him more. And we should do those things. But we can't ever get to where we base our relationship with God on our actions. So the scripture included us all under sin so that the promise might be of faith. And before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. If the law was our schoolmaster and we've now come to Christ and we aren't under the schoolmaster, then we aren't under the law. What part of this do we not understand? And again, see, people just have a disconnect because they think, well, the law is offering animal sacrifices and the law is feast days and doing all of these things. Well, that was the old covenant law, but in the New Testament, religion has made all of these new laws about how you got to be holy and do certain things for God to answer your prayer. You heard Carolina in Virginia talking about that if they wore glasses that God wouldn't heal you. You'd go to hell if you did things like that. That's a new covenant or a, uh, well, it's not even new covenant, but it's this side of the cross law that religion put down that says you're disqualified. God won't move in your life if you do things. And there's just so many things like this. 
I've seen people that would reject you over the way you got baptized. And even if you got baptized, you know, in water and totally dunked, then they'd say, were you baptized in the name of Jesus only or were you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? And they put all of these different things down that disqualify you from having a relationship with God if you don't do it exactly the way they say. That's, that's law. The New Testament church, or let me say the modern church today is living under law. And it's like Paul started this whole thing saying that if anybody preaches anything unto you other than this pure grace that he was talking about, let him be accursed. I guarantee you a lot of the New Testament or modern day church is accursed under those standards. And so it says in verse 26, For we, you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, apostrophe S, possessive, then are you Abraham's seed, singular, which verse 16 said is Christ, and heirs according to the promise. You are Abraham's seed. You, in the spirit, you are identical to Jesus because it is the uh, chapter uh, 4, verse 6 says, He has sent forth the spirit of His Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. In your spirit, you are identical to Jesus because it is the spirit of Jesus that's in you. And if somebody says, well, I don't have the spirit of Jesus in me, Romans 8 and 9 says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you're born again, you have the spirit of Christ living on the inside of you. You are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. And the law is not for you. It was only temporary until that seed came and you are out from under the law. You should not be living with a sin consciousness. I'm tired from talking so fast. Man, I haven't got time to go over there and put it all in this perspective, but Hebrews chapter 10 verse 2 says that if the sacrifices could have worked, which the New Testament sacrifice of Jesus did, then Hebrews chapter 10 verse 2 says you should have no more conscience of sin. Did you know that there's not one out of a thousand Christians that even believes that's a good thing? Most Christians believe sin consciousness is good. Now this is not what Dwayne was talking about, recognizing your weaknesses, that's humility, but being sin conscious where you're condemned. Most Christians think that that's a good thing. And you'll hear many people saying, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. And every time they come before the Lord, they'll start enumerating all of their sins and stuff. The scripture says you're supposed to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. But the modern New Testament Christian enters into his courts confessing their sins and talking about how sorry they are and apologizing. We don't follow that model. We are sin conscious and religion has taught us that that's a godly thing. But Hebrews 10, 2 says there should be no more sin conscience. That is phenomenal. That's amazing. And yet I meet people all of the time that limp through life because they have sinned against the Lord so much that now they believe they're forgiven to the degree that if they died, they'd go to heaven, but they are just living their whole life in shame and still under condemnation when the Bible talks about there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. There should be zero sin consciousness. Even the Apostle Paul, again, Dwayne touched on this, he didn't forget the things that were behind in the sense that he didn't know that they happened because he admitted that he wasn't worthy to be called an apostle because he persecuted the uh, church of Christ. But So he was aware of his past but yet when he stood before the Pharisees in a trial and before Agrippa and Felix, he says, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the, and the high priest had somebody hit him saying, what a hypocrite that you've said you're living in all good conscience. It's because through Christ he had no more conscience of sin. 
He, ha he had an acknowledgement that it wasn't his goodness, it was the grace of God, but he was not living under guilt and condemnation. Man, this is where Christians should be living today, is not under any guilt or any condemnation. And yet most of us are living with all that. So I'm just about out of time here. Let me just summarize chapter 4 because the next time I'm up, I want to share from uh, Galatians chapter 5. But in chapter 4, he begins to start making an allegory between the Old Testament and showing things that were done there and comparing it to the New Testament. And he goes back to Abraham, how that God told Abraham he was going to have a child by promise. And Abraham and Sarah got tired of waiting on God and thought they had helped God. And so Sarah gave her slave, Hagar, to Abraham and he went in and had sex with her and had Ishmael by the bondwoman. And then uh, later the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, no, that's not going to be your heir. The one that comes out of Sarah is going to be your heir. And he said, well, you know, I'm an old man. And uh, God told him, he says, you will have this child by promise. And Abraham believed God. And when he was 100 years old, Sarah, who was 91 at the time, had Isaac, and Isaac was the child of promise. He was the one who inherited the blessing of God. And as Isaac and Ishmael began to grow together, Ishmael made fun of Isaac and mocked him because he was the firstborn. And so Sarah got so upset, she came to Abraham and said, you cast out this bondwoman and her son. He will not inherit with me. And Abraham loved Ishmael, and he didn't want to cast him out, and so it grieved him, and he went and talked to the Lord about it, and the Lord said, you listen to your wife and do that because the uh, child of the bondwoman will not be heir with the child of promise. And so in the fourth chapter, Paul makes this comparison that it's the same thing. The child of the bondwoman is like those who are serving God by the law. And those who are trying to earn relationship with God by performance cannot be heirs of the promise. It's only those who receive it through faith in the promise that can have a true relationship with God. And so the comparison for the New Testament is that those who are doing all of the rituals, and they may be doing the right things, but they're doing it with their faith in what they are doing instead of what God did for them. Those people are not the true children of God. It's only those who access God through putting faith in what Jesus did for them that are the true children of God. Amen. And that's very clearly stated. There's some great passages in the fourth chapter that I just passed over. But if you understand that, I really believe that there are a large number of people who call themselves Christians today because they go to a church and they live a relatively holy life and they believe that Jesus existed, but they do not put faith in Jesus. Their faith is in themselves. If they were to die and stand before God, and if an angel was to try and forbid them, what makes you worthy to come into the presence of God? There's millions of people that call themselves Christians that instead of pointing to Jesus, they'd point to themselves. Oh, I went to church. I paid my tithes. Here's my giving record. They would point to what they've done, and they'll split hell wide open. That's a big statement, but that's not any stronger than what Paul said, that if you preach any other gospel than what I've preached, let him be accursed. There's a lot of people that think they're Christians, but they haven't got faith in Jesus. Their faith is in themselves. And boy, Satan loves that. He hasn't got any criticism against Jesus. If we were truly operating in faith in God's grace instead of faith in our performance... I guarantee you Satan would just lose all of his inroads into our life because he couldn't accuse Jesus and tell us Jesus isn't worthy. But what he'll do is come to us and say, oh yeah, God has power, but he won't do it because you are unworthy. And most people fall for that because they think that somehow or another God is using us, answering our prayers based on some goodness of our own. It's not true. Man, that is awesome. So these are the points that Paul is making. It is only the grace of God. And again, if you are struggling with worrying about how am I going to pull this off, you may not see that as law, but you are relating to God 
based on your own performance. You have taken the responsibility for changing this situation upon yourself. And when you understand the grace of God, man, it just makes life really, really easy. You just cast your care over on Him saying, God, this is your problem. And you, and you don't have to stay up at night worrying about it, Amen. thinking about it. Man, the grace of God is a, it's a great place. Matter of fact, um, I know Dwayne was pressed for time, but the verses right after the ones he read in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, after Paul talked about his infirmity and that God's strength was made perfect in weakness, he said, most gladly, therefore, I glory in my infirmities, in his weaknesses. You can actually get to a place to where, man, God, I just praise God that I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer because it makes me depend upon you. It keeps me from ever getting into the thing where I feel like I have to do it. Those of you that are just one of these perfect persons, that you look good, you got all of these things, you got all of these talents and abilities, in a way I pity you because it's so easy for you to think you can do it. It's really a blessing to know that, man, I hadn't got a chance. God, if you don't come through, I'm dead in the water. That's a, that's a safe place to be. Amen. So you can get to where you glory in your infirmities so that the power of Christ may dwell upon you. Isn't that awesome? Boy, God loves us by grace. He loves us because He is love, not because you are lovely. And once you understand that, man, it just makes Christianity awesome. So, Father, we love you, and we thank you for these truths. I pray that the Holy Spirit opens up our heart, helps us to understand these truths, and apply it to our life. And so we just rest in you. Rest in what Jesus did through the cross. Thank you, Father. And we turn from our own righteousness and our own trust in ourselves, and we trust in you. Thank you, Jesus. We receive that in Jesus' mighty name. I want to ask our prayer ministers to come up here again. I had somebody here saying, are you going to pray for people? Absolutely. So let's have our prayer ministers come up here again. If there's anything we can do to pray with you, uh, please come and let someone pray with you. Remember, we're back tonight at 7 o'clock.